Hello everybody, it's Professor Rich, and today we're talking about making mistakes when speaking English and error correction. So grab yourself a pen and make notes of any interesting phrases that you hear throughout the video. Now we all hate making mistakes and we all want to sound absolutely perfect when we're speaking another language. Interestingly enough, we probably have higher standards of how we want to sound when we're speaking another language than when we speak our own language, which is something I personally experienced when I was learning Spanish and I found myself being incredibly critical with myself about how I would express things using absolutely the correct grammar in all cases, to the extent where sometimes I found myself using the correct grammar when in fact native Spanish speakers would say something else and obviously I recognized there was something strange going on there but this was many years ago and I didn't understand a great deal about language learning at that time however that experience probably does help to enforce some of my beliefs today so recently a long-term viewer of the channel contacted me and expressed some concern that I had suggested not to do error correction and that from their perspective as a language learner and a part-time teacher that error correction was critical in a lesson. So that's basically why I decided to make this video where I'm going to start by saying yes, language learning should include some kind of error correction. After all, if you don't have error correction then what exactly are we doing here? Some sort of modern art style language where anything goes it's like jazz and music or something um no we do we, we we require some kind of error correction but the thing about error correction is it's very very thorny and what i mean by that is there are many many ways that error correction can go horribly wrong which is why I often criticize certain kinds of error correction and I want to make it clear in this video what I mean by that and how I believe and know that error correction should be done correctly. So the first thing to know is that in English language teaching there are two primary types of error correction. These are delayed error correction and on the spot error correction. So delayed error correction means that the teacher, for example, will be taking notes of the errors that the students make while they communicate and then after the communication activity has finished, then the teacher will provide some kind of error correction. On the spot error correction is when the teacher will interrupt the student and indicates that they've made an error and then provides some kind of error correction. So delayed error correction and on the spot error correction. The next distinction we need to make is between accuracy focused and fluency focused activities. This is something that I mentioned in the previous video and I've mentioned many times before. Accuracy focused essentially means that we're practicing the language. That means perhaps we might be practicing a grammar point or some vocabulary and we're attempting to reinforce the things that we understand about that language point. So this can be something which involves writing or some sort of prepared script or it can be spontaneous speaking, but it's often controlled in a way that the speaking activity is restricted by the need to produce these specific language points. So it's not just freer speaking where we have a conversation and anything goes, but it's a speaking activity which specifically requires you to use the language points. On the other hand, fluency-based activities are basically just when you're practicing speaking or communication skills. We're not specifically practicing some kind of vocabulary or language point. 
we're just practicing communication in general and we're allowing the students or the learners to communicate in whatever way they can in fluency based activity communication is the primary objective in an accuracy based activity then getting the forms and use of the language correct is the primary obje objective fluency based activities are more like real life and accuracy based activities are like practice in the gym so let's go into on the spot correction in detail because on the spot correction is the one that can be more damaging if done incorrectly so let's say that the student produces an error and the error is the other day i go park with my friend the other day i go park with my friend now you'll notice there's more than one error in this sentence and that's pretty common actually it's quite uncommon that someone just produces one error one word wrong often there are multiple errors to look at so we want to do some on the spot correction for this so the student says that and here's the bad version of on the spot correction right so the other day i go park with my friend and the teacher says no the other day i went to the park with my friend the other day i went to the park with my friend okay so what i've done there is i've said no and then i've provided the correct answer correct answer so there's a number of problems with this number one you have interrupted the student so there better be a good reason for that but then you just provide them with the correct answer so the student does no work has no engagement and actually has no reason to remember that correction all they have a reason to do is to feel a bit bad about themselves for making a mistake and maybe to kind of clog themselves on the head or something you know and the other thing about that is that your correction that you've provided actually has inappropriate sentence stress because you've stressed the errors which is a natural thing to do you've stressed the errors to point them out and then by doing so you provide this inaccurate model the other day i went to the park with my friend that's not that's not a natural model that you provided so you provided an inaccurate model it's not memorable and the student hasn't had any engagement and maybe it's just caused them a bit of kind of stress if they're a very very studious student a very good student maybe they'll go away and study that themselves and maybe it will have an effect but that student is the 0.01 percent of students so that's the bad version how do we do the good version okay so my go-to when a student makes a mistake in an accuracy focused activity is that i repeat the sent what they said i repeat that back to them but with some questioning intonation so i would say the other day i go go and then i'll see do they notice do they get it does it start to burn a bit and often my students get an idea of what i'm doing when i do that because i do it regularly and so they start to self-correct they say oh uh i i i be i be go i be go and i'll be like mm, i went i went the other day i went park with my friend and i'll be like good so first reward right praise good we still got an issue though right so good but the other day i went mm, park with my friend and this is where i might rely on another technique called uh, finger correction so i'll be like i went mm, mm, park with my friend I went mm, mm, park with my friend mm, mm. and then we'll see if the student can provide these missing words 
So I've given them a bit of a clue. I'm giving them some help, throwing them some rope, but I'm not giving them the answer. I want them to work, right? Because getting into that and working and trying to do it is part of the process of helping them to remember it. It's so much better than just providing the answer. If they still don't get it, then I can start to provide options. I went to or at, and hopefully they'll go with two, and then the, a, or no article, or something like that. Hopefully they'll go with the, they might not. If they go with the wrong one, I just have to tell them the answer at that stage. But at least they've had a go. They've worked a bit. Right, so then we've got it all loaded on the on the um, the hand. So I might ask them to say it. The other day I went to the park, and I'd be like, "Good, now say it naturally," and my students know what I mean by that. So by that stage they'll be like, "Oh, uh, the other day I went to the park." Right, they just kind of say it faster, and I'd be like, "Oh, yeah, that's better." Then I'll give them a model, some clapping. The other day I went to the park. It helps to get it kind of natural. And then I'll get the drill back and then we're good. Now at that stage, we've done all this work on this error and you might think that's a lot of work on one error, but that's the point. You've got to do that work because if you don't, then your error correction is just pointless. It will just evaporate and the students will make the same errors again and again and again. So you want to do that work and maybe even some more. Right? Maybe at this stage, you say to the student, okay, now write that down. Right? So they're doing more work. You're getting them to write it. And then you'll look and see, have they written it correctly? Did they, did they write went? Did they put tur and the? Right? And then you could say, right, underline the stressed words. Right? Say it again. Okay, now write a new version with different information. Right? Last week, I went to the shops or whatever. Right? So we're doing some personalization with the phrase now. You see, we're doing more and we're, we're working with it. And we're doing more work and more work and more work because that's how it'll stick. So that's what you want to do with your error correction. You've got to get students working and engaged and doing stuff. And don't feel like you're spending too much time on one error because ultimately, if that error correction is actually effective, it's well worth it. I mean, this... It, we're not just correcting one word here, we're correcting went, which is really, really common word. And not only that, this might help to get the student tuned in to the whole past if they get it, if they really get hold of it, right? Okay, so moving on, the other type of error correction which I talked about was delayed error correction. So delayed error correction is less likely to be as damaging if you get it wrong, right? So delayed error correction, the standard thing is that the teacher will be making notes as the student speaks, whether it's one-to-one -one or a group class, and then those notes will be used to provide some kind of error correction after the speaking activity. So one way of doing this, and this is actually what I used to do when I first started teaching, is that the teacher will um, show the student all the errors, go through them one by one, and tell them what they should write instead. It's not brilliant because there's very little engagement still, but at least we're actually providing this list of this is bad, this is good, and it's not interrupting the flow of speech at the time. So, okay, it's not bad. It's not great. So then we move on. What other options do we have? Well, there's a whole range of different things you can do with delayed error correction. One thing that I often do is... I'll punch out some sort of activity on the computer, if there's a computer in the classroom, and I'm a very quick typer, so I can type those errors into the computer or something like it and make some sort of, um, like, you know, one of those grammar or language activities. Um, it doesn't take me too long to do. In the final five minutes of the student's speaking activity, I can put something together. So that might be something like, I put the sentences where students have made errors, but I gap the words that were in the incorrect form. And then I ask the students to work together and put the words in the correct gap in the correct form, something like that. <clears throat> 
Another thing you can do is to simply board the errors. That means you write the errors on the board and then ask the students to work together to identify the errors. And if they can't do that, then you underline the part of the phrase or sentence which has an error and then say, can you correct it? And uh, a lot of the times the students as a class can get it. But the point is they have to have a go. They have to try, even if they get it wrong, because that's engagement. That's them working towards it. Another thing that I do with delayed error correction is, and this takes a little bit more preparation, I'll put it into an activity called grass skirts which is where you write the errors line by line with a line underneath for the correction. And then you print them out on an A4 piece of paper and you cut the paper into strips, but you keep it connected at the top. So it becomes like a grass skirt. Then you stick these around the classroom on the wall, teams, and one person from each team goes up, gets a strip, takes it back to the team, and everyone talks together to try to correct the error. When they think they have it corrected, they say, rich, 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 you come over, check, is it right? Yes, then tick, okay, now get the next strip, next strip of paper, the next error. If it's not right, then the teacher can give some guidance on how they can correct it and then leave them to think about it. So this is basically the same as boarding it, but it makes it into a bit of a game, a bit more fun. And um, it seems to be incredibly effective, actually. I've done it, whenever, whenever I do this, things really do seem to stick and people seem to get very good at correcting errors in that kind of activity. So one thing that I think is important to say is that especially with delayed error correction, ideally students should get another chance to try a similar activity or at least another chance to try something where they can use that language again. So one way of the kind of lazy way of doing that would be to just do exactly the same activity again. Ideally you want something slightly different. So if you were doing something like past stories, then you need uh, another activity that would involve past stories that gives the student again a chance to say things in the past, but this time remember the error correction that you've done. So this gives students a chance to kind of implement the teaching and learning that we've gone through. So let's talk about the kind of stages of error correction inside a learner's mind. So the first stage is unconscious incompetence. This means you make mistakes, but you don't realize you make mistakes. With um, kind of advanced learners, we sometimes call this fossilized errors. And with kind of more beginner areas, it's basically just guessing and getting things wrong. That's unconscious incompetence. It means you don't know that you're saying something wrong. And this is a thing that most people are good at pointing out. Even non-teachers are quite good at pointing out when someone else makes a mistake. So a lot of people can get a, a learner through that stage, make them realize actually that they are incompetent. In other words, bring them from unconscious incompetence to conscious incompetence incompetence, which means now the learner knows that they're making mistakes. So they feel kind of bad about themselves and they know that something they're doing is wrong. A lot of people can get the learner to that stage. But we need to move on from there. You know that you're making mistakes, but what we need is we need you to know how to fix the mistakes. Now, just giving the answer is the worst way of doing that. And I've said this a million times in this video now. There's no point in just saying, oh, not go, went. It won't stick. So we need something more than that. So that's where I try these other activities to try and bring the students into conscious competence. That means you know how to fix the mistake. And what this causes is this causes self-correction. And you will actually see learners start to do this. Maybe you'll see it in yourself. You'll see yourself when you kind of learn about an error, you'll notice that you say something, you start to say it, and then you realize you're saying it wrong. The other day I go, I, I, I went to the park and you correct yourself, auto-correction, right? That is conscious competence. And from that stage, you kind of naturally will go into unconscious competence. That is, you say it correctly and you don't need to think about it. So they're the four stages 
and we can that's basically the process of where we want error correction to take us as a language learner so kind of summarizing up some of the general principles of error correction first of all error correction should be engaging it's not just providing the correct answer it's got to be engaging you got to make the students work the learner has to do some work so it sticks so kind of challenging is what we're looking for here interesting engaging but there's some work right we want to make it memorable and in addition we want to give a chance to do it again after the correction hopefully not just in the way of repetition but a chance to kind of go through that process again but this time without the teacher helping so much right so we control practice i talked about well you can get them to write it down and personalize it and say it again and identify the stress and so on and so on and this is the kind of do it again bit but with uh, fluency based practice and delayed error correction we basically we've got the fluency based activity the delayed error correction and then we want another fluency based activity that gives the student a chance to sort of go through that again talk get into a kind of fluency based mode and then perhaps almost make a mistake and self correct bringing them into conscious competence which will then bring them into unconscious competence so they are my thoughts of the day on error correction i hope that's sort of cleared things up a little bit i'm in no way against error correction in fact i am in awe of it i think it is an amazing thing for a teacher to be able to do and it's something that very 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 few teachers are great at um very very few few teachers are good at it um you if you could be great at error correction i'm going i'm going to be completely honest here I've never seen a teacher who's great at error correction, including myself. It's such a thorny issue. It's such a difficult part of teaching to get it right. And I've observed many hundreds of hours of classes of people teaching now. I still haven't seen anyone who's exceptional at error correction. So if there's anyone out there who's got something to tell me about that. You want to tell me a way of being exceptional and that is you know what my principles of error correction are engaging interesting make the students work make it memorable give them a chance to move through those stages then I'd love to hear about it and I'd love to know about it because it's uh, it's a real piece of magic and it's been massively studied as well in academia and they don't have the answers I can tell you that because I read that stuff <laughs> Right, everybody, so thank you very much for watching. My name has been Teacher Rich, Professor Rich, and um, please do smash that. <clears throat> please do smash that like button, hit subscribe, leave a comment down below, and if you have any friends who you think will be interested in this video, then share it with them, because we're really going for it now. Uh, I've got live streams coming up, I've got all kinds of stuff coming up, and I incredibly much appreciate all the support that I get here on YouTube. I, I actually feel like the channel is finally alive again, after many, many, many years of trying to kind of come back from the dead. It's, um, it's good to see. So, without further ado, 